Again, that is John chapter 6, verse 66 through 71. This is the word of God. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. This is the word of God. So, I watch a little too much Netflix sometimes. Um, And I'm sure we all have that issue, right, where we really enjoy Netflix. Um, But for me... It's, it's usually just one show at a time that I'll just binge watch. Um, and so currently, I've been binge watching this one show that I think is a perfect mixture of boring yet interesting, you know, of just kind of delightful yet exciting. Um, and the singles know of this show because I made them watch it on retreat. Um, and it's called The Great British Baking Show. Okay, yeah. Um, and it is... It's honestly probably one of my favorite shows, just because like you can fall asleep to it, but also if you want to watch something, it's well worth your time. But the premise of the show is that in Britain, you know, the country we defeated some several hundred years ago, <coughs> they have amateur bakers, which you know are everywhere, but they are trying to gather their best amateur bakers, 12 of them, and they compete for 10 weeks, but each week someone goes home because they're not up to par. And so they have to bake these different delicate like pastries or shoe buns or different breads and this and that. And I just find it rather exciting because like, I know very little about baking. I know more now. And Danielle would probably tell you how much I judge pies and stuff now, thanks to that show. Um, <laughs> But the show has made me want to go out and bake. Like, I, I, I want to, like, seeing these people, like, they live normal lives. This is not a full-time job for them. They didn't go to culinary school. They're not professional bakers. And then for me, I'm like, I can do this at home. I, I can go to Stater Brothers. I can print off an ingredient list, and I can just put this stuff in my cart, one thing after another, and I can go home, and I could whip up something as beautiful as they do. I'm in the same tier. It's, it's kind of the thought I've had. But, you know, the truth is that I, I don't believe I could ever bake something the way they do. I don't have the capacity to make these little tarts or cookies or, or these, like, beautiful cakes that, that taste delicious or don't have a soggy bottom. You know, it's just like... And so for me, it's like I know I would never make any of these desserts, even though I so desire to. I just know it's too difficult for me. And for some of us, when when we're faced with tasks of great difficulty, it's kind of this fight or flight. But I I believe most of us, when when we're faced with difficulty, we will tend to give up or turn around or leave because we think we can't handle it. And especially when it comes to issues of faith. I know most of us in this room have struggled with the issue of evil. If God was so good, why would he allow such evil to happen? Why would he allow a a nightclub, you know, probably 50 or 60 miles from us to get shot up? Why would he allow people's homes to get burned up um, due to senseless wildfires? In today's sermon, we're going to figure out how are we to respond to difficult things, to difficult situations, to harsh things, to unfortunate circumstances. How can we respond to God well? Well, to better understand our text, we we, we need to look at the entirety of John chapter 6, 
which in case you didn't know, it's a total of 71 verses. But John chapter 6 begins like this. Jesus is being followed by a very large crowd. Now this is, this is a semi-large crowd. You know, we, we, We've got quite a few people here. But the crowd that's following Jesus, we're talking about 5,000 plus in number. And they're following him because he's been healing the sick. Miracles. Jesus has been healing their illnesses, their diseases, and so they're following him. And then Jesus turns to Philip, and he says, hey, we should feed these people. And Philip says, dude, I would have to work for 200 days straight, not spend a single dime of what I'm working on in order to feed these people just a little bit. And you, you want us to give these people a full meal? Jesus, have, have you lost your marbles? Jesus, what's going on? 200 days I'd have to work. There's no way we could do this. And then Andrew, he pipes up. and It's like he's trying to be helpful, but he's not really helpful. He says, hey, there's a boy here with five loaves and two fish. And it's like, I could imagine all the disciples just rolling, their, rolling the eyes in their head like, oh, great, Andrew's piping up again. He's just trying to be the do-gooder. That's not enough food. But you know what? Jesus takes that food. He blesses it, he breaks the bread, and they pass it out. And lo and behold, 5,000 people plus had a full meal. They were satisfied. It's not that they were just given crumbs from a table. It's not that they just, it's like we take communion bread. We usually have a ton left over, you know, when we do communion. It's, you know, it's not like they just took a little piece and said, oh, th- thank you, like, awesome. No, like, they had their fill. They had their fill of it. Enough so much that that afterwards they had 12 baskets full of bread and fish. 12 baskets full. And so these people that are following Jesus around note that like they're following him because he's been healing people, but also because he has met their physical needs of hunger. Not just physical needs in, in health, but also in hunger. And Jesus almost, like, he, he almost starts a mob with this. Because the people are, are just immediately thinking, he heals us, he takes care of us, he feeds us, let's make him our king. He's done more for us than Rome has ever done for us. Rome just oppresses us. Let's make him our king right here, right now. So Jesus, being wise, he slips away. See, I kind of think of that almost as, you know, the, the great temptation all over again. You know, where Satan says, bow down to me and I'll give you this kingdom. Jesus knew that this wasn't the time for the kingdom. So Jesus goes away. The disciples decide to cross the sea. And as they're crossing the sea, it's a dark and stormy night. Waves are crashing. The boat is kind of rocking, probably more than just this. Uh, Probably enough to make me seasick or you seasick. I get seasick pretty easily. Like a light breeze, like doesn't do me well. Um... But the disciples are crossing the sea, and they see a figure starting to come toward them. And it's, and it's Jesus walking on water. And oftentimes when we think about Jesus walking on water, we, we think it's just like this very steady water. Like Jesus just... But no, he's walking through waves. He's walking on top of the water to the boat. And the disciples feared. And, and, the, and the text actually says, immediately as Jesus got into the boat, they reached the other side. Immediately. And so we have these people who are following Jesus because they, they're being healed. They saw this miraculous sign of being fed. The, the, their hunger is being met. Now the disciples have this kind of extra bit of evidence where it's like, wow, he really says who he's, he is who he says he is. Well, the people the next day are wondering, where's the disciples? Where's Jesus? Well, we saw the disciples get into a boat and cross the sea. Let's go across the sea too. Maybe Jesus is there. So 5,000 people cross the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, to Capernaum, and they find Jesus. And they say, Jesus, what are you doing here? How did you get here? Why have you left us? And he says, you only follow me because you had your fill of the loaves. But you really need to seek the bread of eternal life. And the people, 
And this is what's so silly to me about these people, bless their soul, is that they said, Lord, show us a sign from heaven, like, like the one of manna that you gave to Moses. You guys remember back in Exodus when, when they're leaving Egypt and they're out in the middle of nowhere and God provides them with manna and quail. And you just imagine the, the, the Israelites walking out of their tents, waking up, and just all this bread's on the ground. I'm like, this is weird. Like a weird sight, and they just start picking it up, and they have their fill of it. Just never ending. And so these this 5,000 people who were just fed the day before have come and found Jesus and said, give us a sign like the one in the desert with the manna. And Jesus says, those people ate that bread and died. But if you eat the bread that I give you, you will live forever. And they say, well, well what, do we, what do we need to do to get this bread? He says, believe in me. That is the work that needs to be done. Well, then it gets further on. Jesus begins to, to enter into a difficult teaching. He says, I am the bread of life. You must feast on my flesh. Whoa, whoa, Jesus. And, and the first interaction we get from the 5,000 here is the Jews. They say, this is, we know this Jesus. We know where he grew up. We know who his mother is. We know who his father is. We need to feast on his flesh? Psh, get out of here. But Jesus at that moment then prods a little further. He says, no, you don't only just need to eat of my flesh, you also need to drink of my blood. He stabs a little further. What a difficult teaching. And then this gets into verse 60, right before our passage. It says, the disciples say, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? And you see, through this whole time, this crowd of people, the Jews, the disciples, and the twelve, all saw these miraculous signs, the healings, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on water, getting across the sea, and then in entering into this difficult situation, a lot of people start to fade away. So what, how do we respond to a difficult situation? How do we respond to harsh sayings? How do we respond to unforeseen circumstances that hurt our faith? That hurt what we know about God? And so if you have your Bibles, if... Could you open them again to John chapter 6, verse 66 through 71? If you don't, John's like the fourth book in the New Testament right before Acts. Uh, right after Luke. And John writes in, in John 66, set. 66 through 71, he says this. After this, many of his disciples turned back, and they no longer walked with him. And so Jesus said to the 12, Do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we... We, the twelve, we have come to believe and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. You see, as I've portrayed, the, ent the entirety of John chapter 6 portrays three groups. We have the Jews, we have the disciples, and we have the twelve. Okay, and so that kind of gets a little confusing, but as we go further on, it's like, a it's like a giant onion, and a layer of each onion just keeps falling off until we get to the core, all right? And so the Jews fall off really quickly because they really had no faith in Jesus. They're just there to prod and poke, to have people disbelieve, but, but here in our passage, we see immediately in verse 66, it says, after this, Many of his disciples, 
they turned back and they no longer walked with him. And so for us, when we see the word disciple, we immediately think, well, that's the 12. Well, we know it's not the 12 because later on, there's, it's specific. The 12 here still believes. The 12 here has stayed. And so these disciples, these are the people who are following Jesus around. They're being healed. They're being fed. This is, this is for them, the moment of consolation. Who wouldn't hang out with someone who takes care of all of our needs and takes, takes away all our bad days, Right? At any given moment, who wouldn't follow that person around? This is what that crowd is doing. Man, I haven't, you know, I haven't had stomach issues in a couple days. Been hanging around Jesus has been awesome. He, man, I'm always full. This is great. But we see that that was their only goal, is that they wanted to be fed. They wanted to be fed physical food. They didn't want anything further. They didn't, they didn't actually desire a relationship with Jesus. So, like, for example, uh, many churches, if they have the resources or, or the space for it, they'll do like a food pantry. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful ministry. Um, in the, my home church in Florida, they actually did one. Um, I don't know if they still do it, but I remember... You know, about a decade ago, every Tuesday between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., like 50 to 75 people would show up for the food pantry. And they'd come through, they'd gather food items, and they'd go home. It was a great ministry to help those in need, those who could not get food. And this is kind of what I'm thinking here. They come to the church, have an interaction, they get fed, they go home. Or... Think of, I think of this, that like the individual who has a young family and like they're just taking a lot of joy in, in what goes on service time. So singing, praying, worship, reading the Bible at home, listening to other sermons. It's just, it's just all kind of building up like, man, I'm really just loving all of this. It's just kind of like they're eating it. Um, and it's just, it just feels like the Lord is shining on them greatly recently. Like no matter what they do, no matter what's going on, just phew, Man, the Lord is so kind to me recently. And so they take that as, man, the Lord is so kind. I've been able to afford, you know, the house of my choice with a great interest rate. I've been able to, uh, you know, get my kids into the premier preschool. You know, I, my marriage has been going better. It's like the Lord has been shining on me. All this great consolation is just happening. But, however, when consolation ends in the spiritual life, life gets a little difficult. Things don't work the way they used to. And so, for the food pantry, you know, if they were to take that ministry away, the people would stop attending the church. We just wanted to be fed. Not to say that's, that's a bad thing or a bad part of the ministry, but it's just part of what happens sometimes. Or, let's say, the, the child who, who got into the premier preschool, they start throwing something from the back seat, and you get into a minor car accident trying to take him to, take him to preschool. Oh, you're just ruining my day. God, where are you? And then you get to work, and you get rid of for tardiness, not for the first time, but for like the seventh time. And, and your boss is starting to jump at you, and you go, God, where are you? I, you know I just bought this house. You know that I really need this job to pay for that mortgage. God, what is going on? Where have you been? And, and, and this person begins to just distance themselves from God. God, it's not worth it. You're not giving me what I want. See, much like these disciples had thought, I'll be free from illness. I'll always be full. And Jesus said, your forefathers ate of that bread and still died, but you must eat of me in order to have eternal life. Too difficult. I'm out. But when difficult teaching or situations happen, our passage shows that some will definitely abandon. They will abandon the grace of God. They will abandon Jesus but it also shows this. 
Some will wrestle with God, and they will embrace it. Verse 67, Jesus, after seeing all these people walk away, it's, it's not just a few. It's not like you guys walking away from me, you know, like 50, 60, 70 people. We're talking thousands of people. Nearly 5,000 people walking away from Jesus with only the 12 remaining, and he turns to them. He says, do you, do you want to go away as well? Because we have to think for ourselves that, that even the disciples, they had to have wrestled with what Jesus was saying. Jesus, this is weird. This is odd. I've, I've never heard anything like this before. What, what are you teaching on? And so we see that there's this, this wrestling But Peter, Peter answers for all of them. This, uh, this could kind of be assumed as, as kind of a group answer. He says, where, where do you want us to turn to? We, we have nowhere to go. Because we know for certain that you are the Holy One of God. Even if we don't understand every word you say, even if we don't understand every teaching, we know that our encounters with you are absolute truth. You, you are life, and you're life to the full. I think of when a young family struggles, uh, like with the news that their youngest child has pos- like a possible life-threatening illness. And it's kind of one of those things where it's like the parents have to wrestle with, God, how could you allow this to happen to my family? How could you allow my youngest to, to endure this sickness? Or, or I think about that, that child siblings just thinking, God, why would you allow my little sister or little brother to get sick like this? But but the difference between the family that, that just gives up and, and the family that perseveres and wrestles with God is one that interacts with God. God, don't understand it, but what are, what are you doing? God, I'm going to continue to seek to lean into you, but, but what are you doing? God, I'm going to seek spiritual counsel still, but I don't know what you're doing. Why is it so difficult? Or think about the college student that has to do a group project because they stink and they force us to do them sometimes. Uh, and, 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 and in their group project, there's just always this one person that berates the Christian faith. It's always the butt end of jokes. And, and they're just sitting there, and they're just like, Lord, this is so difficult. Lord, this is harsh. I, I don't know how to defend my faith here. I don't know how to, how to properly live in a, a life of, of an example here. Lord, it's so difficult. What are you doing? And they begin to wrestle. But we can see that when a harsh situation is presented, some will abandon, some will wrestle. But for those of us who wrestle, for those of us who who stay next to God in those unforeseen circumstances, in those harsh teachings, in those difficult uh, situations, the appropriate response is to know and to believe that Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God. Regardless of the difficulty, Christ is who he says he is. That's our response. Our response is to trust in God no matter what. This is not a blind faith. But this is a faith that that we have actually experienced. We wouldn't be sitting here today if we didn't have some sort of experience of God at some level. And so the twelve who have been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. They see his miraculous works. They see him healing people. They see him feeding 5,000 people out of five loaves and two fish. They see him walking on water. They hear this difficult teaching. They're wrestling with what he is saying. And yet, Peter says, I got nowhere to go. You have the words of eternal life. His response was to recognize God, I don't understand everything. But you do. And I realize you do. I'm staying with you. 
And so the young family that's, that, that's struggling with this illness of their youngest child, they go before God, God, I don't understand what you're doing. Why my child has to go through this, but I know that you are real and that you care for me. I have seen it time and time again, and I will not doubt your goodness here. This is difficult, this is harsh, this seems cruel, but Lord, I know that you are real and that you care. I will not abandon. Or the college student, they, they, they take comfort in, in finding 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And so the prayer becomes, God, I know that the situation is miserable for me. I don't like being the joke. I don't like being made fun of for my faith. But Lord, in this storm, may I lean on you, may I rely on you, may I open to you. But even in these profound words of Peter, of the 12, where he says, you are the Holy One of God, Jesus responds one more time. And he says, did I not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? And this goes to show us that it's not just one instance of difficulty. It's not two or three or four, but difficulty, unforeseen circumstances, harsh situations will come at us time and time and time and time again. At this time, Judas still believed that Jesus was the Holy One of God, that he had the words of eternal life. Yet Christ says, and yet one of you is a devil. And John gives us this little note in verse 71. He says, he spoke of Judas, the the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. This word for devil here can mean like slanderous. Um, One who is kind of, it's like when someone who has kind of offended you and you're kind of angry and is like, you're the devil. It's kind of that. You're not actually saying like you're Satan, but like you slandered against me. You've you've offended me. You've hurt me. Um, And so Jesus actually is pointing this out. One of you will betray me. And so where difficulty arises again for the disciples, one eventually caves in and gives up. Jesus, it's too difficult. I'd rather have 30 pieces of silver. It's not worth it. You see, there has never been any promise that, that the circumstances in our lives will be perfect once we accept Jesus. That has never been part of like the, like the covenant agreement right, that we sign. But what I do know is that no matter what the situation is, whether it's being fired from a job, rejected from a school of your choice, uh, whether it's not advancing in life like your friends or your coworkers have, like these things will challenge us daily and force us to wrestle with God. And and to be honest with you, there will be more difficult teachings than those. There will be more harsh situations than those. There will be more unforeseen circumstances or cruel, cruel experiences that we have. However, every single time, brothers and sisters, we must respond in faith. God, I don't know what's going on, but I do know you are the Holy One of God. You have the words of eternal life. You are life. And so no matter what, Jesus, I know that you are God, I know that you are holy, but here I am again, my health is poor, my marriage is falling apart, I am drowning in debt, I am not enough, but I know that you are the king of my life, even if I don't understand what you are doing. Following Jesus is difficult. Not many people can do it. Jesus teaches an offensive teaching here, and many walk away. Even after coming into contact with miraculous signs and wonders. While some abandon Christ during the storm, the response of the faithful, brothers, sisters, you, you and I, our response is to know and believe that Jesus is the Holy One of God. No matter what situation comes forward, we can know that in the fog and confusion that God does all things for good, and, and I see this even for myself in this situation. Lord, what are you doing in my life? What, what, what things have you called me to? Lord, 
Lord, I'm sick of, of not being able to, to provide for my family the way I, I, I want to. I, I'm sick of, of not advancing the way I want to, whether it's in ministry or, or academics or this or that. But I know that I must rely on God. God, this is a difficult time in my life. But I will not doubt you. And I will not doubt your goodness. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to look back upon the way God has impressed upon you. Even in the midst of difficulty, of harsh situations, of cruelty, and to realize, God, there's no one like you. Even in this time, there's no one like you. Would you pray with me?